appreciate everybody that's joining for this class of uh, Hebrews. <clears throat> now, I probably forgot exactly where I left off last time, but let's just back up a little bit to uh, verse 19 of uh, chapter 7, or let's say verse 18, chapter 7. So for on the one hand, there's an annulling of the former commandment <clears throat> because of its weakness and unprofitableness. And because of the, the weakness and the imperfection of the, the flesh, the old law uh, couldn't perfect anything. Instead of a, a mere change in the law, it was completely abrogated, done away with, replaced. But, you know, we must keep in mind that the old law was never intended to be uh, permanent. It is always intended to point to something better. In verse 19, it said, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there's the bringing in of, bringing in of a better hope through which we uh, draw near to God. And of course, that's the, uh, the gospel, the New Testament. And the reason, this is the reason that the law was abrogated and replaced. It could make uh, no one perfect. It was introductory, introductory and uh, temporary. And it gave a uh, rise away to a law that had better promises. In uh, Galatians, the third chapter, verse 21, it says there that is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not, for if there had been a law given which uh, could have given life truly, righteousness would have been by the law. And one thing we need to keep in mind is that the old law was a law given by God. So the fact that it was given by God <clears throat> means that it was perfect perfect for the uh, purpose for which it was established. And again, I say it was never established to be permanent. It was always to be temporary, as Galatians will say, which I'll get into later, that it was to be a schoolmaster or a tutor to bring us to Christ. It says in uh, verse 21 of Galatians, the second chapter, I, did not, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if the righteous just comes through the law, it was never intended for the righteous to come through the law, then Christ died in vain. <clears throat> and when we get into chapter 9, we'll, we'll go into that great detail. <clears throat> Romans 8, chapter uh, verses 2 through 4, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. And the reason that the old law was sin and death is it didn't have a provision to, to uh, expiate anyone's sins. He goes on to read there for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And we'll get into that later on why that had to be on account of sin. He condemns sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. <clears throat> the law required perfection. If you violated one part of the law, all it could do was condemn you. That's, that's the righteous requirement of the law. If we walk according uh, to the spirit, then we have forgiveness of sin through the through the gospel of the uh, New Testament. So a better hope was uh, granted to man through God's uh, pardoning grace in the, in the gospel. <clears throat> in Romans, the uh, fifth chapter, verses one and two, it says there, therefore having been just by, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace, which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. In verse 20 of uh, chapter 7, it says, And inasmuch as he was not made priest without a, an oath. Uh, the oath of God, you know, keep in mind it wasn't necessary. If God be true, he didn't have to do things by an oath, but he did it because, well, because man, the oath of God uh, was given. Therefore, it's confirmed and guaranteed that Christ is now our high priest. Temporal 
uh, priests were not sworn in by an oath, but through authenticated genealogy. Uh, the high priest came from the uh, family of uh, Aaron. All the priests came from the tribe of Levi. And so it's by genealogy that they were appointed priests. But Jesus was not that way. He was made high priest after his resurrection, not during his earthly ministry. So he had already died and he was made priest after he was resurrected. <clears throat> Whereas uh, the uh, Levitical priesthood, they were made priest before they died. And then their priesthood ended when they died. <clears throat> In verse 21 of chapter 7 says, for they have become priests without an oath. Uh, keep in mind the Aaronic priesthood was established by decree, it's not by an oath. In Exodus 28 verse 1, we read, read uh, now take Aaron your brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as a priest, Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab and by Eliezer and Ithmar. <clears throat> So they, they didn't say, uh, you know, I may not want to do this. God just appointed them. You are going to be our priest. And from your family, that's where the priest can come from. It goes on to read, but he, that's uh, God the Father, <clears throat> with an oath by him, uh, God the Father, who said to him, Jesus, the Lord has sworn, and, and swearing is an oath. That's an oath. And will not relent if his uh, will on the matter is never going to change. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, the uh, priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, uh, and that's the priesthood of Christ, it will never change, it will never be abolished. And the covenant on which it's based, that's the New Testament, the gospel, uh, it will never change. Or be abolished. Uh, that's to say that <clears throat> there is no pre priesthood beyond the priesthood of Christ, and there's no covenant that's going to replace the new covenant. It's you know, all that has been done, and it's set. Christ will continue as a priest as long, uh, and king, king also as long as the. Uh, work of man's redemption, redemption is, going, is going on and then is fully accomplished. In verse 22, he says, <clears throat> by so much uh, more, Jesus has become a surety. And again, keep in mind, you know, for God to be faithful and true to his word, he doesn't need to make an oath, but he does for us. And he doesn't need to give a surety because you know what he, what he what he says goes so he doesn't need a guarantor for a god-given covenant nevertheless he gave christ <clears throat> as our surety and that's for our benefit but what if we should uh, reject the, that surety this is a surety of a, a better covenant well <clears throat> It would, would certainly be uh, bad to do that. Now, the Levitical priests, they received their appointment through, uh, uh, according to a uh, mutable, I mean, it, it can change, in the transitory law of lineal descent. It perfected nothing since it was by design uh, preparatory to a better covenant. Now, the new covenant was inaugurated by Christ, of which he was made a surety. As such, this new covenant embracing the uh, priesthood of Christ and the justification, sanctification, and redemption of mankind uh, provided to those, uh, it was provided to those who believe and obey him, and it will never be abrogated or replaced until its uh, purposes in, in Christ have been accomplished. In verse 23, <clears throat> And we read there, also, uh, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing uh, the Levitical priesthood of the old law as opposed to the priesthood of the, of the uh, Christ uh, was uh, temporary. They couldn't continue beyond their physical death. 
but as I said before, Christ didn't become high priest till after his physical death. So Christ is the eternal. The, therefore, if he's eternal, then his priesthood is eternal. The uh, many priests of the old law change, and the one priest of the new law abides forever. It never changes. <clears throat> In verse uh, 25 of chapter 7, it said, therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost. Yeah, the uttermost means absolutely. I mean, there's nothing beyond uttermost, absolute pardon. Save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Uh, salvation, of course, must be attained and maintained by continual faithfulness and submission to the will of the Redeemer. Since he always lives to make uh, intercession, so all that uh, Christ is doing for us, that's uh, Christ our high priest, all that he's doing, he's sitting at the right hand of God, keep in mind that, and he's uh, therefore ready and able to plead our case. He's our intercessor. And it's uh, done for them. Those, it's done for those who come to God. So he can save those who come to to God through him. And verse uh, uh, chapter, uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 31, uh, is set forth therein the decrees and designs by which uh, one may be saved. And it reads there, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are, who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, that he might be the first, firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these also he glorified. And what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? That might just to point out this, uh, the wording here, predestined. Uh, uh, you know, that, that he called us and he uh, foreknew and this, all the other. You have to keep in mind that uh, he has, uh, instead of predestined, maybe a better word to use, predetermined. He predetermined that there was one way in one way, one way only that mankind was going to be saved. So that is, uh, that way is predestined, is predetermined, and he's going to call those, uh, those who want to be justified, he will call them through the gospel, and they're going to be justified through the gospel, gospel and then they'll be glorified as a result of that. <clears throat> In verse 26, he says, for such a High priest, and that's uh, that has to be one without sin. You know the, the Levitical, uh, the Mosaical uh, high priest. They were not without sin. They had sin, and any time of the day of atonement, they went into the holy of holies. They had to offer sacrifice for themselves. <clears throat> so this high priest is one without sin, and, and he's able to save us. For such a high priest was fitting for us. That is, it fits our needs in the. Christian life, who is holy, that is, pious and uh, reverential, as are, uh, that is, is bearing, that's the way Christ is. He's harmless without malice or ill will. Uh, he's undefiled. He doesn't have spot or blemish. Christ was never disqualified from his duties because of personal defilement. And some of the, the priests were, if they were defiled, they couldn't serve. But he was never disqualified from his duties because of personal defilement. He was uh, separate from sinners. That is, he was without sin. That would separate someone from the sinners. And he has become higher than the heavens. <clears throat> and that says he has absolute supremacy, supremacy over the whole created universe. And in Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 22 to 23, says there, and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things 
to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. In verse 27, <clears throat> again, speaking of Jesus, who does not need daily as those high priests, you know, of the old law to offer up sacrifices. You might want to just jot this down to go look at the uh, 16th chapter of uh, Leviticus. Uh, he didn't have to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins because he didn't have any. <clears throat> and then for the people's, for this he did once. There, he had one sacrifice himself, one time, forever. He uh, didn't have to uh, offer up sacrifices for his own sins, but he did it once for all, all those who obey him. When he offered up himself, <clears throat> Now, he was not compelled to go to the cross or shed his blood. But it was, he did it voluntarily because he knew uh, what it meant uh, for mankind. And that was the only way that mankind was going to have remission of sin. So it, he offered himself up. And it was hard. I, I understand it was hard, but he still did it voluntarily. <clears throat> But even so, he did not put himself to death. He was at the hands of others. They put him to death. But again, uh, he uh, gave his own blood. <clears throat> now, like the uh, Levitical priest, he did need to offer himself up first for his own sins uh, because he didn't have any. <clears throat> Therefore, he uh, offered himself up for the sins of others. In verse 28, <clears throat> for the law appoints as high priest men who have weakness. And if you want to see that, you can look at Aaron and his, uh, you know, the golden calf. Remember that? So they had weaknesses. But <clears throat> the word of the oath, that, that is, after the order of Melchizedek, which came after the law, <clears throat> oath was given after the old law was in effect. It points the uh, son who has been perfected, uh, and we're going to talk about perfection later, but it's, it's and King James has consecrated, <clears throat> uh, but we'll talk about that later. He was exalted to be the uh, head over all things to those who put their faith in him and it says forever he has been perfected forever and and forever just means as long as it was intended to last <clears throat> forever can mean just a short time it can mean well forever <laughs> so uh, jesus was appointed high priest under the, the gospel and uh Chapter 8, verse 1. And it says uh, there's a few points that have been made in uh, the first and second uh, verse. And we'll uh, cover that. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. The first thing is that we have such a high priest. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Second thing is uh, who is seated at the right hand of uh, right hand. That's the second, you know, we're talking about main points. That's the second main point. Third main point, seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And you go down to verse uh, two. Fourth point is uh, minister of the sanctuary. And the fifth point, he's a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle. And the sixth point is which the Lord erected, not man. So let's go back over that. <clears throat> uh, we uh, have such a high priest, first point. Uh, the church main, uh, sustains the same relation to heaven that the holy place did to the most holy. The only way to 
heaven was to the church and then the way to the holy of holies was to the, the uh, holy place so it bears the same relationship the second thing is who is seated at the right hand <clears throat> uh, the holy place or the tabernacle it corresponds with the ordinances of the church you know you, you keep in mind that uh, now Jesus was seated at the right hand so uh, the things of the ordinances of the church that he implemented it was right there in the most holy place in the holy place <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> third main point the throne of the majesty in the heavens uh, the church is compared in Acts 15 verses uh, 16 and 17 through uh, the uh, I lost my place here. It's compared to uh, a booth or, or a tent that's large enough for Jews and Gentiles to find shelter. <clears throat> uh, in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, verse 16, it says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? So the uh, tabernacle, the, the fifth point that he pointed out, the tabernacle, the church is the church. We are, we are the church. <clears throat> It says in 2 Corinthians uh, 6, chapter verse 16, and what agreement has the temple of God? That's us with the idols. For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I, I will dwell in them and walk in them, be their God, so forth, they shall be my people. <clears throat> in uh, Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 19 through 20, uh, Two it says now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of the saints and members of the household of God. That's the church, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and Jesus Himself being the key, chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple. That's the church, the tabernacle, on which you are, you also are being built together for a dwelling place uh, of God and the Spirit. <clears throat> he says in 1 Timothy uh, third chapter, verse 15, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the, of the truth. <clears throat> so that the uh, heavenly Temple, tabernacle is, uh, is the church. In Galatians <clears throat> 3 17, and this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot know the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make uh, the promises of no effect. So uh, the promise of God is, is going to, to come to fruition, if you will. <clears throat> Let me get a drink here. <clears throat> In verse 3, it says, For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. <clears throat> well, he didn't have uh, things to offer that the high priest of the old law did. You know, the high priest, day of atonement, would offer uh, bulls and goats, blood of bulls and goats. Of course, he would have to take one and lay his hands on it and at least uh, diplomatically transfer the sins of the people of that, and then they send it off to the wilderness. <clears throat> 
but Jesus didn't have any of that. The only thing he had to offer uh, was a uh, was himself. So pre uh, Christ is a priest in the heavenly or archetypal sanctuary. Uh, verses one and two. For there he has no priest without some sacrificial function. Verse three that we just. Uh, read. And if here on earth, he would not be a priest at all. Verse 4, which we haven't gotten to yet. <clears throat> Where there are priests already who serve the typical in the uh, shadowy sanctuary. It's the type. And in verse 5, which we'll get to, the priestly functions of Christ must therefore be discharged in a higher sphere. It couldn't be done here on earth. And so it was offered discharge in the higher sphere. So that priest must offer a sacrifice, and priest is a priest. Therefore, he's got to have something to offer. But he can't do it on earth because he's not a out of the Levitical priesthood. He's from the uh, tribe of Judah. Therefore, it must be in heaven. That's the only place that he could uh, serve as a priest. And he doesn't offer a sacrifice time after time after time as the uh, uh, Levitical priest did. But he offered a one-time sacrifice <clears throat> for himself. Uh, it's a continual offering, for which was the only means to procure our salvation. That's the only way that it could happen. You know, the sacrifice and blood of animals couldn't do it. It couldn't expiate sin. So it, as we've already explained in verse four, for if he were on earth, he would not be a priest since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law. And the law said they had to be from the, pre, the tribe of Levi and the high priest from the family of Aaron. Now the Hebrew Christians uh, likely understood this point. I was talking to Aaron that, uh, that uh, Eric, that uh, the people at that time had to understand what was being uh, told to them. You know, it may be a little obscure to us at times. It may take a lot of study, but they knew what it was being talked about. Christ was not the, the tribe of Levi, uh, the house of Aaron. There, therefore, he couldn't be a priest to officiate in the the earthly temple. That priesthood and the law under which it operated was abolished when Christ was crucified. It was nailed to the cross, Colossians 2.14. The church uh, became the heavenly temple, the spiritual temple. And you might ask, uh, and maybe these uh, Hebrew Christians were asking, I, I, I know that that may be part of the problem that they were thinking about going under the, back under the law of Moses. Question that we should ask is why then was the Jerusalem temple and the Levitical priesthood allowed to continue to operate? Well, God doesn't always just uh, bring things to a sudden close. You know, He's got to consider the practical uh, continuance of things. And of course, it was for practical reasons that the law of Moses was allowed to continue. It was a civil law. So you know, they didn't have anything else. So it was allowed to continue as a civil law. And keep in mind that the Hebrews was written, let's just say, AD 65, maybe in 64, maybe in 66, but somewhere in that time frame. But, you know, if the Hebrew Christians didn't understand it now, they were going to understand it very shortly because it was uh, destroyed in AD 70. <clears throat> you might say that uh, the, the destruction of the Temple ended that uh, the uh, mosaical economy, the, the system of worship in the temple, the Levitical priesthood, and all the, all of it was done away. So the competition with uh, the Christian religion from the mosaical, the Jewish religion, was uh, ended. In the Hebrew chapter eight, verse five, uh, again talking about the 
these earthly priests, they serve the copy in the shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, as God said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. <clears throat> so the uh, tabernacle of the, of the wilderness and of course the uh, Jerusalem temple, there were a num number of them, they were only intended to be a shadow of the heavenly tabernacle. Since it was a representation of the heavenly temple to come, Moses was divinely instructed to make all things according to the heavenly pattern because it was uh, to be the type of the heavenly temple. So it's important that the uh, representation was uh, done right. We, we should not think of the uh, church as brick and mortar. You know, we always I think we get in the habit of saying we're going to church. Well, we're going to the building that, that the uh, church meets in. So church is not brick and mortar. It, it's just not that. The, the local church in Spring meets at the building, building on Spring Cypress Road. But the building is not the church. <clears throat> The church is a divine institution. It's composed of all those saved souls. And of course, we say the church in spring, we're talking about those saved souls that meet at that location. So it just it doesn't matter if they meet here or elsewhere, uh, or they departed. If they're you know, Christians and departed, they're still in the church. <clears throat> in Ephesians, they have first chapter verse three it says blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ who has blessed with every who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in christ and we do have uh the blessings here but the the, the ultimate heavenly uh, blessing is going to be uh, our heavenly home salvation in heaven Ephesians, the second chapter, verses five through six, it says, even when we were uh, dead in trespasses, uh, it you know, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And looking at uh, Hebrews uh, nine chapter, and we'll get that, get to that probably next time <clears throat> he says therefore it is necessary that the copies of things in the heavens should be purified with these but the heavenly places the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these so the, the heavenly things are better than the uh, the shadows or the types and they were just uh, a representation of the the true things that are in heaven. In verse 6, chapter 8, <clears throat> but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry that's more excellent than the uh, uh, Levitical priest, inasmuch as he is also a mediator, that's a means a kind of a go between, a middle, uh, comes with those two words in, in Greek, mesos, and uh, Emmy, but I'm like uh, Eric, I'm not sure how to pronounce those, but it means a, a go between the middle. So that's mediator. <clears throat> it says the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on uh, better promises. <clears throat> yeah, his ministry is better because the new covenant is better than the old covenant. And Moses, of course, was a mediator of the uh, Old Covenant. Now, the salvation of men necessitated that the mediator should himself possess the nature and attributes of him towards whom he acts and should likewise participate in the nature of those for whom he acts. I sent apart, the, of course. Only by being possessed of both a deity and a humanity could he 
compromise. When we're talking about Jesus, could he comprehend the claims of the one and the needs of the other? Whether the claims and the needs could uh, be met only by one, that's Jesus, who himself being proved sinless would offer himself as an exp expiatory sacrifice on behalf of man. In Galatians, the uh, third chapter, verses 19 through 20, what purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of the transgressions till the seed should come to him uh, to, to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of the mediator, that's between God and Israel. Now, a mediator does not mediate for one only. There's got to be two parties. But God is one. <clears throat> now, that has given no small amount of uh, problems for those who are trying to figure out what that last part means for that God is one. There have been numerous uh, interpretations, of, if, you, if you will, with that. In fact, uh, Burton Kaufman, he's, he wrote a commentary too. He's, he, just, he just made it to, I don't know what it means. So there have been about 400 interpretations of what, what God is one means. And I don't know what it means. So I'm not going to try to explain what it means. <clears throat> but you kind of keep in mind what uh, he's been talking about here. That he's talking about the, uh, the law was given, uh, but before the law, there was the promise made Abraham. There was no mediator at that time. And the promise to Abraham, uh, part of it was fulfilled in Abraham's time. Part of it, uh, certainly messianic. Uh, but that was not given through a mediator. So in that case, God is one. There was no mediator, mediator between God and Abraham. And if you have another uh, uh, idea about what that means, you, know, you can let me know after class. But anyway, in, in, in 1 uh, Timothy verse 2 and 5, it says, For there is but there is one God and one mediator between God and man, man Christ Jesus. Uh, the reason for that is because he's both God and man. He can do it. And he's still the mediator between God and man. And he sits at the right hand of God. And he uh, makes intercession for us. So it's uh, 8.30 now. So I think I'll conclude here. And we'll take up uh, at Hebrews 8, verses 7 next time. Thank you for your kind attention. And as soon as I stop the recording, you can ask questions.